year was, I think, one that we can characterize as a year of Southeast Asia. Uh, for those of you who have been watching you know, migration or funds flows from different regions around the world, uh, personally, I've seen you know, flows coming out of China moving into Southeast Asia. Uh, the question really is, is whether this is just you know, a flash in the pan or this is something that will be sustained. Um, after all, uh, Southeast Asia, I think, has been a junior partner to China and India over the last many years uh, as an investment uh, destination, as an economic powerhouse. Uh, but it may surprise you that in the last seven years, uh, Southeast Asia has been growing as a consolidated GDP at about 5.2%, uh, not, you know, a, uh, not a rate that we can ignore, not, not a growth rate that we can ignore. Um, so in this AIC, we thought that it would be useful to give you an opportunity to look at Southeast Asia as a, an economic region of interest, uh, one that has been discovered by many investors last year. Um, you may know that some of the markets in Southeast Asia have been the darlings of the investment community. You know, whether it, was, it has been the Philippines, which for the last two years has been outperforming most um, markets, uh, Thailand has been a you know, winner last year. Uh, Indonesia has been for the last many years uh, been a favored uh, investment uh, destination. Malaysia, of course, uh, was, uh, is domiciled for three of the largest IPOs ever done last year globally. Uh, so I think Southeast Asia, indeed, is a, is a very, very important uh, market to look at. And today, we're very, I'm very, very pleased um, to have two uh, expert leaders uh, from two very important economies uh, in Asia, and I just want to uh, make some brief introduction to our two panelists uh, today. They represent both the business as well as the public sector uh, in two of the important economies in the region. Let me start off with, you know, to my extreme left and to the center of, 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 of the room. Uh, for do those of us in the Philippines, somebody who does not need any introduction, uh, Mr. Manny Pangilinan. He is uh, CEO and founder of First Pacific, a group that he founded back in 1981 right here in Hong Kong. Uh, today, First Pacific represents probably the largest corporate group in the Philippines. When you look at consolidated earnings, consolidated revenues, um, it's a conglomerate um, that one that a Filipino living in the Philippines cannot live without because it provides electricity, provides water, provides us the cell phone. Um, it will soon be providing you know, mining products that will go into different things that we also use. Uh, it runs tollways. I mean, really, it's into everything that's happening in the Philippines. Uh, Mani, uh, before uh, founding uh, First Pacific, um, did his uh, BA uh, in Ateneo. That's a very distinguished university in the Philippines. It happens not to be the one that I went to, but nevertheless, it's very respectable. Uh, <laughs> Well, but we of just, course, we just elected the Pope. You know. <laughs> <laughs> he compensated by taking his MBA at the Wharton University, the University of Penn. Uh, uh, to my immediate left, uh, we're also very pleased and honored to have really one of the most sought after advisors in Indonesia, certainly by presidents and ministers of finance. Um, our friend, uh, Pa Muhammad Chatib Basri, is the chairman of the investment coordinating board of the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, this is a position that he took over after serving as the vice chairman of the National Economic Committee of the President of, the, of Indonesia from 2010 to 2012. Uh, prior to that, he co-founded a research institute called uh, CRECO. Uh, it's an economic consulting firm. And he also served as a senior lecturer at the University of Indonesia. Uh, outside of his government uh, advisory roles, uh, he is also an independent member of the Asia Pacific Regional Advisory Group of the IMF, uh, comprising of nine prominent experts in Asia Pacific. So Pat Basri really comes to us you know, with great credentials and experience and insights, not only with what's happening in Indonesia, but indeed around the Asia Pacific region. So you know, maybe I can just start off, uh, Pat Mani, with uh, maybe just a general question, just to give our audience a, an overview. And, and maybe I can ask you for your view on the outlook for ASEAN, and perhaps how ASEAN is relevant to your respective roles. You know, Manny, a CEO of one of the major conglomerates, not only in the Philippines, but also you know, having businesses in Indonesia, 
uh, previously in Thailand and now in Singapore, and Pop, perhaps from the point of view of Indonesia, you know, what's the relevance of ASEAN? Pop, may we start with you? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Lito. If I may start, let me perhaps uh, talk from the, uh, the global perspective first. Um, I think about last year, the Asian Economic Development Bank produced a report, the so-called the Asia 2050, where it's put really the Asia as one of the center of, the gro uh, the center of growth uh, in the global economy. And we are talking about this uh, Asian century. Well, of course, this is something that we can we can uh, discuss or debate whether we agree or not. But if you look at on the current situation uh, with the Euro debt crisis uh, in Europe and also one of the problems with the fiscal cliff in Europe, somehow that, like it or not, we see there is a shift of paradigm of the uh, source of the global growth toward Asia. And if you're talking about Asia, there are three major pores of growth. The first one is the one that I call the greater South Asia, basically India as the uh, center of growth. The second one is the East Asia, and you are talking about China, about Korea, and also Japan. And the third one, and I entirely agree with you, there is one region that not many people look at it. This is the Southeast Asia. And it's very interesting now, if you're talking about India, they used to grow by about 7%. But now India grew by about 5.3%. And if you're talking about China, they used to grow by 9 but now they grow by 7.5%. So some of the attention start to uh, shift towards Southeast Asian economy. And I witnessed this. I, was, I accompanied my president during the Asian leaders meeting last November in, in Phnom Penh. Uh, even the President Obama himself, the Prime Minister of Japan, uh, Prime Minister of India, you know, many leaders attended the ASEAN meeting. It reflects that how important ASEAN in the global context now. This is the region with the 600 million populations, and we are talking about 1.8 trillion, about GDP. And from that perspective, 48, not many people realize that 48% of the total ASEAN GDP is basically Indonesian economy. And 42% of this total ASEAN population is Indonesian population. So somehow, Indonesia play a core role here, especially talking about the issue of the leadership, issue about this direction of the policy. And if you look at about the intra-trade uh, among within the ASEAN countries as well, it increased you know, um, quite substantially in the last couple of years. So when we are talking about the new shifting of the global paradigm, definitely, ASEAN is one of the potential uh, in the future, especially with the fact that India and China are facing the slowing down of the economy. If you look at the average growth of the Southeast Asian economy, we continue to grow uh, more than 6% uh, last year. So a lot of potentials. And a country like Indonesia, because the size, because the populations, play a major role here. So this is the way we look at ASEAN. The second one is from the geopolitical perspective, because we, we have China on the one side and also Japan on the side. One of the role that ASEAN would like to play is to become a hub, a major driver for this, you know, the relationship between uh, China, Japan, and also India. So this, the strategy is always ASEAN plus. Yeah? On this particular issue, I think uh, this is the thing that uh, probably we have to look at about the future because this region will become a very important region in the future. I think I'll stop it here a little. Thank you, Pa. Ma Mani, uh, same question, but for me, perhaps from a corporate perspective. Well, for us, uh, we tend to look at ASEAN in rather simple terms. Uh, as pa Basri uh, indicated, this is a market of about 600 million people. And uh, if I recall correctly, about 50% of its population is uh, 30 years or below. And uh, the income average is uh, Three thousand dollars or not, uh, or more, no? and uh, growth rates in ASEAN as a whole is is um, ahead of certainly other regions in the world, between five to seven percent. Uh, uh, now we have to bear in mind that within that grouping are three major categories: you know, the more developed economies uh, like uh, Singapore and Brunei, who, whose growth rates are are slower than the rest. Uh, anywhere between 1.3 to 
six percent. Of course, Malaysia is much faster, but they belong to that more developed mm -hmm. category. And then the middle-income countries, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia, between five to seven percent each year. And then, of course, you got the transition economies: uh, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia. Now, so it does, uh, you know, the, the the economic makeup, the regulatory. Uh, uh, structure of each of these countries tend to differ from each other. So you do, you know, from that kind of a structure are rich opportunities to take your, you know, take hold of the ri investment risks uh, in each of these countries. And of course, raises the question of whether indeed by say 2015, mm -hmm. the much uh, talked about integration can occur given the disparities in economic, political, and legal infrastructures of each of these countries. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned about 2015 because there's a lot of expectations about end of 2015. It's uh, supposed to be the, uh, the start of the ASEAN economic community. Perhaps not everybody in the audience would be too familiar with what it actually means. Perhaps, if I may, you know, since you represent uh, the government sector, what, does actually, what, what will happen at the end of 2015 and what, what's the relevance to you know, investors like this room full of people or businesses like uh, you know, First Pacific? Well, of course, this is this Asian economic community is a bit different with the European community because we are not talking about the single currency here mm -hmm. at this stage, but we are talking about this one single market regarding this free flow of this uh, investment mm -hmm. and also trade. And we also try to standardize some of the products as well. So some products that we could sort of like produce in Indonesia that could be accepted in, in Philippines, in Thailand, etc. And this will be a big market. And, and besides that, beyond that, uh, at the leaders' meeting in Phnom Penh, the leaders also agree uh, to have this to launch this RCEP, which is basically ASEAN plus six. This includes Australia, New Zealand, you know, Japan, Korea, and India. And we are talking about 25 trillion uh, trade. Yeah, uh, a couple of years from now, about 2015. So if you're looking about this potential, this is really big, but of course this is not an easy task because all the countries, the member of ASEAN, should commit it towards reform, including open up the trade regime, you know, the uh, investment regime, and we are working on it. Perhaps it's just you know, the preliminary and we can discuss it later on. Well, that's a macro view. Manny, maybe you can take us to the micro view. I mean, what's, okay, 2015, you open up the markets, how relevant is that to First Pacific? What does that do to your businesses? Uh, what, where do you see the opportunities in the, at the end of 2015? Well, from, from, from a uh, micro perspective, from a corporate perspective, uh, it's more we're looking at the same as, as investment destination for us rather than you know, looking at the uh, investment flows intra-ASEAN or the trade flows intra-ASEAN. I think it's, it's a little... I think more difficult to predict as to how that's going to pan out uh, by by 2015. Um, but you you brought a delegation to Vietnam very recently from the yeah. Philippines. Uh, is that a sign that you are looking at moving capital from you know from your head office to to Vietnam, for example? Yes, uh, I think there are very interesting investment infrastructure opportunities in Vietnam. The inefficiencies you see uh, we see in the Philippines on the infrastructure space are quite similar to what we see in Vietnam. Uh, having said that, the, the kind of governance and financial standards are rather different from what we see, for example, here in Hong Kong or, or the Philippines. Not to say that Vietnam will not move up eventually to the kind of international standards that uh, international investors are used to. Mm -hmm. But I, I've also read that I think your group has recently made an investment in the power sector in Singapore, which is, of course, a surprise, you know, coming from, from the Philippines, making investment in the more developed part of ASEAN. Uh, what, what would be the, uh, the, the objective for, for that investment? Well, it, it's, it was, uh, you know, basically an opportunistic uh, uh, investment for, for the group. Here was a power plant of some significant size that is uh, already late in its construction phase and should actually, the COD commercial operational date would be end of this year. And Singapore is a very organized power market. No? Mm -hmm. So uh, the returns are not, uh, you know, they're not 100% or it's double digit, low double digit, but it is, it is a good investment uh, climate for, mm -hmm. for the group to take a risk on. on it. 
May, may, may I yes, join please. on this? I think, I, because I think this is, this is very important. This is really the real example about this, you know, how the ASEAN can work. Uh, I believe, Lito, that the future of this economy, not only in ASEAN, this will be on the production network, the joint production network. If you're talking about this, this joint production network, you're talking about the supply chains, actually. Mm -hmm. So with this integrated of the ASEAN economies among the countries in which like Philippines start to invest in, for example, like in Singapore, this will enhance, really enhance this cooperation to the production network. With this country left behind in terms of production network, we cannot join this. That perhaps will be in, in difficulties in the future. So if we can use or taking this example, I don't want to mention uh, the name of the company. Yeah? As one of the company, for example, they want to access the market in Indonesia, but they invest in one particular country in ASEAN in order to take the advantage of the FTA. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, they are come to Indonesia because the logistic cost is much cheaper there. So that kind of things, that's probably that will be the strategy in the future. Mm -hmm. So by having this economic, ASEAN economic to be integrated, I think uh, this is the thing that we really, you know, we really uh, want to expect in the future. If I may just go back to an earlier comment you made, you, you, you made mention that there's still a lot of work to be done, or at least that was implied, I think, in the comments that you made. We're looking forward to the end of 2015 for the uh, start of the ASEAN economic community, but there's still a lot to be done to be able to really, you know, to, to reap the fruits of what a common market might provide us in ASEAN. Could you maybe elaborate on some of those challenges that still need to be uh, addressed? Well, even though my position in the go on the government, but probably I'm not too diplomatic, so let me be <laughs> honest and frank with you. One of Please. the problem, <laughs> one of the problem with the ASEAN, is we always work in ASEAN way, in the sense that we always work in consensus. Yeah. It's probably this is good, but if we choose this way, then perhaps the progress is always relatively slow, rather than you know someone really take a lead, and they, you know. Uh, many countries in Asia, the, the main issue is always about leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the good thing is, um, you know, uh, since the last since the last couple of years, Indonesia is showing that intention to take a leadership because very normal because as one you know as the largest country in Southeast Asia, if Indonesia can play a role, that become very important. The other issue is how to show the to make use the chairmanship of ASEAN. I was talking about this production network, um, how to integrate the, the, the economy. The main constraint for us, in my view, is connectivity, right? So we need to ensure that the logistics around the ASEANs that will be integrated. But if you're talking about connectivity, the reform on the connectivity is not easy mm -hmm. because this related to the national treatment, some national regulations. This making this progress is not always easy, especially if we always work in consensus. Yeah, but of course, this is the political reality that we have to face. So, so we choose the ASEAN way. So we are making progress, even though some people probably disappointed with the progress that they consider is relatively slow. But I do some, some hope and I do believe that we are moving into that, that direction. Thank you very much. Yeah, at this point, I think this will be a good time to uh, take some questions from the floor. Um, if you want to ask specific questions to our two gentlemen or, or macro regional questions, you know, feel free to do so. Uh, so, yes, there's a gentleman on the, this side of the floor. If you can just hand him over the mic. Uh, as energy demands are increasing rapidly in Southeast Asia, would the two panelists like to comment on ongoing disputes between China and the ASEAN countries over access to hydrocarbon resources in the South China Sea and how these disputes might be better managed in the future? Thanks. Who would care to answer that question? <laughs> now I have to speak like a government official. <laughs> well, it is, it is a, uh, speaking from the Philippine perspective, it is a, obviously a very politically sensitive issue. No? And uh, as Pabasri said, it's, it's uh, ASEAN works by way of consensus. Uh, the Philippines has opted to take both the legal and, uh, and the political route in terms of the uh, settlement of the South China Sea's issue. And um, I think in that respect, to be honest, I don't think ASEAN has taken a unified stand with respect to what, how to approach uh, and manage uh, China in the matter of the South China Sea sovereignty. You know? so, 
it is a difficult one, um, I must say. Um, uh, to be fair to China, our understanding from their position is that they have uh, uh, been consistent in respect of that position to their credit, namely that if, if uh, we were to set aside the issue of sovereignty, then they're prepared to deal with the commercial aspects of the transaction. No? Uh, in many respects, we, of course, we can only speak as a business person. Uh, we, we, uh, we can only push the discussions with uh, our counterpart in China uh, to the point where there could be a commercial transaction. And at the end of the day, if there's gas there, then there is a basis for a commercial uh, transaction. If there's no gas there, there's nothing to speak about, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you do need to determine whether there's the hydrocarbons resource there, and we can only do that by exploring and drilling the relevant wells um, in, in, the, in the area. Mm -hmm. So we, we need uh, an understanding with China, so to speak, uh, before we can send uh, survey vessels and uh, oil rigs in the area. Babastri, would you like to offer some no. comments? I'll uh, leave it to you. <laughs> Perhaps if I, if I may rephrase the question then so that you can take it from a, an ASEAN perspective. Is there any role for ASEAN as a community to help facilitate a, uh, a resolution of these issues? And as much as there are four members within the 10 member ASEAN community who are, who are involved in this issue, Malaysia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Brunei. Well, as my understanding, this is a very uh, sensitive and a very difficult uh, situation, but the way we look at this issue is always we have to settle it through the ASEAN countries dealing with China rather than you know, separately for each country. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this making the position of the bargaining position of the ASEAN become very weak, but certainly uh, what we want to achieve on that process I cannot to talk further because this is part of the issues that are being discussed at the ASEAN uh, leaders meeting. But certainly the position is we want to settle this issue properly. Um, the ASEAN itself have a discussion with China regarding this issue and the position is quite clear, at least the Indonesian position. We want to have this issue from the ASEAN perspective rather than the individual, individual members. Thank you very much. Can we have the next question, please? Yeah, uh, Hi. <clears throat> Hello. Since uh, many of us are investors in this room, I wonder what uh, issues you think would w an investor should think about in investing in ASEAN nations that they might not be used to in more developed markets like the U.S. or Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Manny, would you like to take the first crack? Well, it's, it's uh, one of the major questions I'd like to think would be the question of political stability. Because earlier in our conversation with uh, uh, Pahir and uh, Lito, uh, there are a number of elections that are uh, coming on stream no? uh, in Indonesia. Thailand. In fact, if I may, Manny, I, I, let me just enumerate them. You know, general elections in Malaysia coming up next right. couple of months. Ele presidential election in Indonesia next year. Uh, 2015, it's Thailand's uh, general election or scheduled general election. And then Philippine presidential election, yeah. 2016. So every year we were exposed to this. Yeah, so that's, that's uh, I would, it's a question that's been posed with respect to the Philippines, what happens post uh, this administration. More in the matter, I think, of governance, because this government has exhibited uh, its, its focus and its, uh, its, uh, its adherence to uh, good governance. So that's, that, that will have to be factored into your uh, investment decision. Well, if I may add on this, I think it's one of the issues that at least the thing that we learn from the investors is issue of this doing business about the investment climate. Yeah, so I have to be to be frank and honest with you that some of the problems related to the issue of this uh, doing business because the licensing process, the issue of corruption, uh, some issues related to the uh, legal system, it makes uh, creates uh, uncertainties for the investor. So for the investor who, quote unquote, doesn't have a sort of like knowledge about Southeast Asian countries, they may, uh, in the beginning, they may find a difficulties on that process, but uh, I, can, I can give an, uh, a lot of uh, example to you 
that many investors come to Southeast Asian countries, then they become uh, very successful in Southeast Asia, as long as you know how to handle this issue about this uh, doing business, the legal issue, yeah, and also, of course, about the political uh, sensitivity in many countries. The other thing is also because the ASEAN countries is various. If you're talking about ASEAN 5, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, Singapore, Thailand is more or less, even though a difference in terms of income per capita, but more or less comparable. But if you compare with the C CLM fee, like, you know, like Cambodia, uh, Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, perhaps at the different stages. So even though we are part of this ASEAN, then we really have to look at the, about the market as well, the segmentation of the market. Mm -hmm. But, but the thing much. is, if I may add, Lito, you, yes. you do have to, uh, for example, one, one lesson we took away from that trip or trips that we've had in Vietnam is that you do have to respect how they do business there in each particular country. Uh, if capital were specific in terms of, uh, you know, when you ask for money, uh, you have to identify what you want to use the money for. Uh, the, the investment destination is also true that applies to them because you have to respect their how they did their policies, their rules, their regulations, even their financial standards. No? Because we've been in a bidding situation out there in Vietnam and we applied our rules, so to speak. At least we're familiar with the first specific and we lost. We lost. Thank you. I think there's another gentleman in the same part of the room. Uh, Credit Suisse actually published a report early last year uh, regarding talking about the growth of the ASEAN market the last 10 years. And it say that the growth is actually coming mainly from high raw material price, including coal and palm oil for Indonesia, oil and palm oil for Malaysia, and other soft commodities, including rubber and rice for Thailand. And it say that in ASEAN, it's only two industries that have gained global competitiveness in the last 10 years. It's only auto industry in Thailand and the business outsourcing in, uh, in the Philippines. So my question is, first, do you agree with that Credit Suisse report? And the report said that if, if, commodities, <laughs> price, if commodities price came down, ASEAN would be in big trouble. So at first, whether you agree on that report. And second question is, what is, what is ASEAN going to do to improve its um, manufacturing competitiveness? Thank Before you. Before I finally answer that, I will just uh, advise him that there's only one correct answer to the first question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would like to add upon that that analyst is no longer with Credit Suisse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that speaks to the, to the, uh, to the fact that these, these can, the economy, the economic structure of these countries are quite different. Uh, the countries that you mentioned, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Singapore as well, are pretty much export driven, right? On, in the commodity space, not the Philippines. We are domestically consumption driven as an economy, the tourism sector, the BPO sector, and domestic consumption being fed by overseas remittances. We are not an export driven economy. So the, the kind, the extent to which we get affected by external shocks is limited. So to that extent, the economy benefits. But in, when the global economy is doing very well or Asian economies, in general doing very well, we don't benefit much from, from the resulting trade uh, that, that emanates from that kind of thing, from that kind of uh, very buoyant uh, development. Yeah. So how to reconcile these different uh, economic structures, not to mention political and legal infrastructures in an integrated economic union is for us a big question mark. That doesn't mean the opportunities uh, don't don't, uh, don't uh, lie in, in these countries, they do. But we don't look at it for now as an integrated economic unit. Ambassador? Well, I, I, I certainly agree uh, with you pa about this, you know, the characteristic of these, each economies among the, the ASEAN member, a country like, like, like uh, Thailand, like Singapore and Malaysia is more export oriented, whereas uh, Philippine Indonesia is more domestic uh, economy. So it's rather difficult to sort of like having this conclusion about the ASEAN, the characteristic of ASEAN. But one thing that I can uh, share with you, despite of this various characteristic among the countries, I would say that overall the ASEAN economy uh, still robust with this, you know, with this growing middle class, with the young population that Philippine has, the Indonesian has, somehow this really a bigger potential market. That's the first one. But 
your second question is also very important. So let me let me take the perspective about the, from the Indonesian uh, perspective. What happened if the commodity price, uh, you know, uh, down or the energy price down? It is very interesting, perhaps, to look at about what would happen with the shale gas in the U.S. You know, if they could produce the shale gas less than three dollar, perhaps they will make less the U.S. become less dependent to the to the Middle East, which somehow affect the energy price. If energy price uh, affected, if you look at in the last 10 years, there was a positive correlation between energy price and commodity price. It means that the commodity price may fall as well. Then the question is what will be the impact for the country like Indonesia? I have to be frank with you, the 65% of our export is energy and commodity related. So this somehow will affect our export. So on the export side, this may be affected and especially for the people who live outside Java. Because if we're talking about the characteristic of the country, Java is mainly manufacturing, and outside Java is basically commodity and energy. If the people outside Java are affected by this, and there will be a possibility of the declining the domestic demand. they somehow affected by this. So that is why the government is preparing and anticipating for this. A country like Indonesia, we cannot continue to rely only on natural resources or cheap labor. Somehow we have to move into value chains. And that is why the role of ASEANs play a role. Because if we want to move into value chains, then the issue of the production network, the logistic play a role. We have to be integrated with Thailand, with Singapore, who has a sort of like, you know, uh, export-oriented market, and also like Philippines, like other countries. This is the way I look at this issue. I think if I may just yeah. add a dimension to our power plant investment in Singapore. Um, we, we, one consideration, albeit not a major one, but certainly one that might be important in the long term is that we understand, it's probably not much uh, publicized, that certain ASEAN countries, we don't know exactly who, but we think it is Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, have entered into a power grid agreement to interconnect the power systems mm -hmm. uh, so that I guess there would be this uh, interplay of power sources that will assure security of supply, but perhaps impact eventually in power prices in each of these countries. No? So we'd like to participate in that, in, in that power grid uh, prospect. And who knows, one day can we connect uh, the grid, uh, say, via Mindanao, with, with what may be available in Indonesia. Uh, secondly, uh, Petronas is a 30% shareholder of the power plant, and that, I think that opens up a, uh, a potential opportunity to, to work with Petronas, uh, particularly with respect to Meralco's plans to build a gas-fired plant or plants in the Philippines. Perhaps we could talk to them about, about uh, I think we've raised it, in fact, with Petronas about the possibility of gas supply to, to the Philippines from from their gas fields. So these are rifle shot opportunities, for such, but they're important, I think, for the region and, of course, for us. Thank you, Manny, for, for raising that last point, because I think it's something that maybe I'd like to explore. You know, the, the, that ASEAN is not just about you know, free trade within ASEAN, but really it's, it's a creation of new partnerships within the region. And I think you, you mentioned about possibilities with Petronas, as far as your group is concerned. Yeah, maybe to, to both our panelists. What, where do you, uh, can you comment on the, the potential benefits that the ASEAN community can provide because of, of, of business partnerships that will be created out of this? And, and are you already experiencing that? And does that you know, either benefit Indonesia or benefit First Pacific? Well, uh, certainly in the, in, the, in the power sector, uh, the Philippines, about half of our fuel source is, at least from a morale perspective, is, is natural gas from Malampaya, but we, but we don't know when actually the gas uh, supply will, will end. It will end one day, starting perhaps 2023, 2025. So we do have to look for alternative sources of gas. Uh, indeed, as Pa said, uh, the U.S. might be a potential supply of uh, shale gas, but that's, you know, they're so far away. Is, is Malaysia, is Indonesia a potential source? We have to take a look at those sources from a security standpoint for for the Philippines, and there are three significant gas plants in Batangas, and I don't think the country can afford to ha have those assets stranded without a secure gas supply no? in the event that Malampaya uh, runs out, 
by some date, or indeed if we are able to proceed with the development of uh, SE-72 out there in uh, the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. Not from an Indonesian standpoint, is, is that something that the Indonesian government is trying to promote? I mean, you know, encourage Indonesian companies to go out there in the region and explore partnerships, uh, collaborations? Yes, yeah, certainly, Lito. If, if I may mention uh, names of the companies, yeah, um, I can give an example that uh, last October, L'Oreal opened up its largest cosmetic in the world, uh, factory in the world in Indonesia. And the objective of this, you know, of this factory is actually to cater to about 70% of the market in Southeast Asia, which is put the production base in, in Indonesia. Similar with Toyota, about last week they opened uh, one of the factory with launching the new brand, Etios, which is basically which will be produced in Indonesia like Soluna in Thailand. So I look at it, this is really the part of this, you know, the company start to uh, making using of ASEAN as a market and put the production uh, production network. In addition to that, for the future, I think it's very important for the issue of the domestic, like a food security or energy security. Um, in Indonesia, we are talking about self-sufficiency, for example, like for rice. But we do still have some problems regarding this issue of the agriculture product because maybe productivity is still relatively low. And one way to solve this problem is we encourage Indonesian companies to invest outside Indonesia, perhaps in Laos, in Cambodia. And later on, if there is a need for this food security, then we can import it for a country like Cambodia and Laos for Indonesia to ensure, uh, you know, to cater our domestic market. So, so by doing this, you know, we encourage more investment, you know, not only come to Indonesia, but also to, to go outside Indonesia to secure the issue of food security, the energy security. I think, I believe this is the way like China also secure their energy uh, issues. Thank you very much. Uh, can we have more questions from the floor? Yes, gentlemen in the middle. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you see going forward and in particular with regards to uh, skilled labor and also the importance of FDI for um, kind of the, the continued growth, I think in particular in the Philippines where we've seen relatively nascent form levels of, of FDI. Mm -hmm. So what question is around skilled labor, uh, perhaps as a constraint to, you know, to ASEAN, uh, perhaps not uniformly, uh, and then second question is in foreign direct investments. Perhaps um, let, me, let me address your question. Uh, it is true that one of the problem that Indonesia is, is facing now is about the skilled labor. Yeah, so uh, because Indonesia is moving into the, the value chain, so we, sh we move from this unskilled labor into the skilled labor, and there is still some gap about this. So what the government is doing now is to encourage more on the issue of the vocational training, uh, encourage the companies, and the thing that I'm still working on it, unfortunately, I have been, been very successful to convince my colleague, the Minister of Finance, towards it. My proposal is, why don't we ask the private sector to do the training and provide a tax deductible? So rather than the government provide the training center, because to me this is more makes sense rather than you know the government create a training center. This somehow will help the issue of this uh, skilled labor, or maybe in the short term, a sort of like the technology spill over come from the direct foreign direct investment. And this is related to your second question. A country like Indonesia last year. Uh, we booked the record high in terms of foreign direct investment, 24.5 billion US dollar. We just jumped 27% from the previous year. It was, it was uh, very significant. And we booked about 86 billion US dollar commitment to invest in Indonesia. So in terms of this, uh, many foreign direct investments start to look at Indonesia and why this is important. So let me share with you. To achieve 7% economic growth, Indonesia need investment over GDP is about 37%. But our current domestic savings is only 32%. There is no way you can run the economy with the 7% growth and having this current account deficit 5% because it will not be sustainable. So the only way to do it, you encourage the foreign investment to come to the country. So my short answer is this role of foreign investment become very important to ensure that Indonesian economy could achieve the 7% economic growth in order to create jobs to reduce poverty. Okay. Manny, the same two points. Well, um, 
th there's, there's, there's always a mismatch in any economy between the output of, uh, of uh, skilled labor, be it managerial or, or blue collar type uh, of, of, uh, of output, no? human output that you, that the, say, the educational system generates. Uh, our own experience, for example, in the Philippines, is there's, there's quite a bit of mismatch, to be honest, across all levels, managerial and technical. Let me cite one particular case in the mining industry. There's a dearth of geologists and mining engineers in the country uh, for a number of reasons. There are, of course, inadequacies, which I think the country recognizes in our own educational system, which I don't think we'd like to talk about uh, this afternoon. But I think the role of business, and we've been encouraging businesses, uh, business groups in the Philippines to do so, is that we must, we must develop together with government an agreed economic blueprint that will define not only the resource resources needed, financial, man manpower, legal, et cetera, that we as a business and the economy need, right? And give that as a purchase order, if you may. I know this might be so sound too idealistic. To the academe and say, look, we need every year so many engineers, so many IT technicians, so many whatever, managers, so that then, then, the, uh, then the, uh, the academic system can produce the relevant supply that the businesses need, the economy needs. No? Uh, there will always be mismatches between what's produced and what's, well, what, the, what the businesses need. But we need that kind of, of uh, cooperation between the, the academe and the business sector now. And I think the government has a uh, role to play in trying to, to reduce the mismatches between what businesses need and what the, the academic community produces by, by way of graduates. As the matter of the FDI, yeah, the Philippines uh, ranks rather low in terms of absolute amounts of foreign direct investments. Now, I think it's not a question of confidence in the government or in the economy. I think it's a question of finding the outlets. Uh, there's tremendous liquidity within the system. And uh, I've said that uh, we have to provide more vents to the liquidity seeking out investment outlets. No? And the easiest of those outlets are the stock market and real estate. So I think there's concern about the, the asset bubble being created. So if you open more vents that are more enduring in nature, like if people invest in airports, in light rail, in, in tollways, in power, then, then I think the economy will prosper more. No? Thank you. I think there's a gentleman at the side. Actually, a question is related to what you just mentioned. Uh, the property market in certain countries, ASEAN countries, is overheated. Credit Suisse, for example, just came out to report on this. Uh, in Philippines as well. How, uh, how confident are you that this growth we see right now is really part of an efficient allocation of capital and to what degree are we here again uh, in a boom and bust cycle that finally at this 2015 is not really that kind of a big bang we hope for? Well, it, it, it certainly, I think from our perspective, uh, beneficial if the uh, investments were to flow into what I said, the more enduring uh, type of outlets. So, uh, you know, the, the Philippines needs a lot of in infrastructure work, um, investments. I think the uh, president's mentioned manufacturing, even agriculture, uh, certainly the tourism sector are things that the, the country needs and can, 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 um, can uh, excel in. No? So if we could find the appropriate outlets, more and more of them, uh, I think that's where the investments should, should, should flow and perhaps uh, cool down a bit the, what you mentioned, the real estate and uh, stock market. No? The, the easiest to go ahead into and the easiest to exit from, right? Thank you. Apart from Indonesia. Well, I may, I may have a different view on this for the case of Indonesia, because if we're talking about that the property market is rather is overheating, um, I'm not really sure because if you compare about the property price in Indonesia is much, much cheaper compared to many countries in, in ASEAN, even though if you look at the way in terms of the credit growth towards property, it's still, it's very, it's very hard to say that the potential of bubble, it's really there, yeah. The second issue is in Indonesia, there is a limitation which not allow the foreigners to buy this, this property. Unless we open this, 
to the foreigner. Then I can, I can see it and I can imagine that the property price will go up quite significantly. But rather than that, you know, I'm not too worried at this stage about this issue of this, you know, uh, overheating on the, on, the, on the property market because I know this is a very rough an example. This is really an anecdotal evidence. If you compare about the, you know, the price of property in one, the most expensive business district compared to like, like Singapore, of course, it's not entirely comparable. It's probably only one fifth mm -hmm. yeah, compared to that. So it, I don't know, how, how do you explain if Indonesia is overheat and how do you explain Hong Kong and, and, <laughs> and Singapore? <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. We have time for just one more question. So if there's any, uh, yes, a, a gentleman in the middle of the room. Uh, just one thing. So, with this minimum wage high, uh, the hikes in Thailand, Indonesia. So, uh, as an investor, we see that the co corporates are losing out on the competitive. The cost uh, things are going up. But how do you see that this will eventually end up uh, fueling inflation down the line? Uh, because I see that uh, probably seeing happening in Jakarta specifically. Well, um, on the issue of this uh, wage hike. If you're talking from the foreign investor perspective, uh, let me give the data with you. The investor that focus on the labor intensive is only about 9% of the total realization of investment. So most investment that went to Indonesia is basically uh, capital intensive or natural resources. Yeah? So the impact is rather limited. The second one, most of the foreign companies actually they pay the wages higher than the minimum wage because somehow they have to comply with the standard regulation. So the one really affected by this is mostly local or the small medium enterprise. And about the impact of the inflation, I think the situation is rather different with India. Yeah, with this the increase of the wage hike spiraling with this accommodative monetary policy. In Indonesia, you know, the role of this commodities play a major role in terms of this, you know, uh, inflation. For example, like the import restriction on some garlic and onions like a couple of months, last month, it's really pushed the inflation to relatively high. But now the government, the government opening up the import, which is, I believe that somehow the inflation will become under control. Mandy, any comments on the labor rates? Well, I, my, wage? my impression of inflation rates in ASEAN is fairly, the rates are fairly benign, maybe with the sole exception of Vietnam, where I think it was oh. double digit in 2012, but, or 2011 then down to high single digit in 2012. We don't detect any wage, co wage push inflation evident in the Philippine economy as such. So that seems to be fairly well managed. Okay, as, as an opportunity for our panelists to make their closing remarks, maybe I'll just ask one question for hopefully a, a brief answer. If you had to give one investment tip to this room full of investors <laughs> that would take advantage of the ASEAN story what investment would you suggest to them? Well, if I may suggest is go to the consumer products. With this growing middle class, with the young population, this is really the region for this, you know, the future business. I think most of the you know, consumer products are doing very well in many countries in ASEAN, except Singapore perhaps because the population is very small. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Manny. Well, by very specific. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, before I end this session officially, I just want to uh, ad advertise that, uh, you know, for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about some of these ASEAN countries, there is a specific session on the Philippines at, uh, I believe it's at four o'clock. There's also a session in Indonesia, which uh, Fab Astri will be leading. Uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, what it's time? Three. Three o'clock. Yeah, after this. And I, I hope some of you were able to join the Malaysian uh, the panel session uh, earlier this morning. But we've tried at Credit Suisse to provide you really an ASEAN full of, of, of presentations, both at the regional as well as the country level. I hope you have found this uh, session very useful. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, uh, you know, Mani Pangilinan and Fab Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.